Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to share this message this morning. And Lord, I just pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Move me out of the way, Lord, and speak your words through me. May this be a blessing to all here. And may it draw us closer to you and to your ideal for our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> all right, so my name is Ashley Sneddon. I am a nutrition and dietetics technician registered. I am also registration eligible, which is a term for almost dietitian. Basically, I just have to sit for the board exams at the end of the month, and then it'll be official. Um, but I'm also a certified health and wellness coach, and I'll share a little bit about my experiences throughout this presentation as well. Amen. And the subject is diet reform or diet deform? And how can we make sure that it's actually reform and not deform? Some of the topics that we're going to go through today will be the importance of diet and health reform. Is it important that we include diet and health reform? And how? What is temperance and how is it connected to diet reform? Secular food philosophy. What is the popular ideology out there these days on food and nutrition and diet and appetite? And food, is it moral or is it amoral? That's a big controversy these days. Avoiding extremes, the origin of our appetite problem, how I was introduced to the health message because I actually wasn't raised Adventist and I was introduced to it, and the ap answer to our appetite problem and how we can reach people with diet reform. So we'll start off with the importance of diet and health reform with a passage from Testimonies of the Church. Um, as a people, we have been given the work of making known the principles of health reform. There are some who think that the question of diet is not of sufficient importance to be included in their evangelistic work. But this is a great mistake. Mm -hmm. I think this highlights just how important diet is in health reform and that it does need to be included. As we see in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, <coughs> Do all to the glory of God. So the subject of temperance in all its bearings, including diet, has an important place in the work of salvation. And I think that this also highlights not only the importance of diet in health form, but how diet is so closely tied in with temperance. And what does that actually mean? Yes. Is your forum set up so that we can ask questions? Is that what... Or, or do you want to go through it, then questions? I would say write down questions as we go, and then at the end there will be some time to answer. Thank you for asking. So what is temperance? Right? True temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything that is hurtful and to use judiciously that which is helpful. Mm. There's this popular saying that has always kind of driven me crazy, and it's everything in moderation. moderation right? But is everything in moderation true temperance? Cocaine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, probably not moderation. So everything in moderation means that you're using both the healthful and the hurtful in moderation. But true temperance is everything healthy in moderation and cutting out completely the things that are harmful to us. But this everything in moderation ideology is so pervasive in the world today when it comes to food and really anything that we're consuming with our five senses, right? Food philosophy in secular dietetics. So I was trained in nutrition and dietetics at Arizona State University and Barrett the Honors College and then completed my dietetic internship supervised practice hours with mostly non-Adventist organizations. Uh, one was with an Adventist based out of Oregon, but the vast majority of my exposure has been in the non-Adventist nutrition world. And I'm actually really glad that I have them because I think it gives me insight into the food philosophy that most people in the secular world are adhering to and how we can reach people where they are within this food philosophy. So the popular notion now is that food is amoral. That means that there are no moral restraints, standards, or principles regarding food. Something that you'll hear a lot in the dietetics world today is all foods fit. All foods fit. There are no good or bad foods. You should not feel shame, guilt, or regret for anything that you put into your mouth. 
So the question becomes, is food and appetite moral or is it amoral? Is it actually a moral issue or doesn't apply? And so if we look at the definition of morality, right, from the Oxford Dictionary, it tells us morality is principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. God's word tells us, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I'd say that's another definition of morality. So the question is, is there a good way to eat? Is there a bad way to eat? Mm -hmm. And can the Spirit of Prophecy give us any insight? Many Bible texts too. Absolutely. Um, and so I just highlighted a few. And it kind of gets more and more serious as we go along, but we're starting off with this one, right? The good, right? There is such a thing as good nourishing food, right? As we see here. There is such a thing as wrong habits of eating and a perverted appetite, right? It's wrong to eat merely to gratify the appetite. Where wrong habits of diet have been indulged, there should be no delay in reform. By indulgence, this wrong practice becomes a habit, right? If our physical habits are not right, our mental and moral powers cannot be strong. For great sympathy exists between the physical and the moral. And this one is very serious. I would say, often the work of those who have important plans to consider and important decisions to make is affected for evil by the results of improper diet. A disordered stomach produces a disordered, uncertain state of mind. Often it causes irritability, harshness, <coughs> or injustice. Many a plan that would have been a blessing to the world has been set aside. Many unjust, oppressive, even cruel measures have been carried as a result of disease conditions due to wrong habits of eating. Wow. Unjust, oppressive, cruel measures have been carried as a result of <coughs> wrong habits of eating. Wow. This does sound like a moral issue. But we'll take it a step further. Transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. I don't know how it could get any clearer than that. For God is as truly the author of physical laws as he is the author of the moral law. His law is written with his own finger upon every nerve, every muscle, every faculty which has been entrusted to man, and every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. Does this sound like it has moral value? <coughs> I think we can conclude that our food habits, including not just what we eat, right, our dietary quality overall, our choices overall, but why we're eating, right, our appetite versus our hunger, right, something that is appealed to in the world of dietetics these days when they talk about this all foods fit philosophy, there's no good foods, there's no bad foods, is, well, we all experience hunger, it's a universal physiological need. And that's true, we all do experience hunger, but we don't all eat simply to feed ourselves, to nourish our bodies. That's not our main motivation. Our appetite goes deeper to our desire. And what is our number one desire in life? Is it to honor God and bring glory to Him through everything that we do, even the things that we eat, right? Or is it to satisfy our base animal passions. It also has to do with how we are eating, right? The way that we are cooking foods, the way that we are preparing foods, the way that we're chewing our food, what types of foods are included in a particular meal. These things are also important. And then when we are eating, right? The timing of meals. And I would even go further and say where we're eating, right? Because if you're eating in an environment that's very stressful, and you're not able to mindfully eat, that can also impact your ability to take in those nutrients and to digest 
everything. So all of this does have moral value associated with it. Remember, true temperance is completely get rid of everything that is harmful and use sound reason and good judgment with everything that is healthy. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, mm. right? Sometimes even a food that was made by God to be nourishing and healthy can be harmful to a particular person while helpful to another. Right? Diet is very highly individualized. While we have some broad general rules we can apply, right? Genesis 1.29, God gave us a plant-based diet in the beginning, but there are particular things that can be individualized from one person to another. And we can see here the importance of evaluating, right? The importance of mm. listening to what our body is telling us exactly. when we do something, right? When we put something into our mouths, how are we responding? What is our body telling us? And we can see here in Ministry of Health, it is impossible to make an unvarying rule to regulate everyone's habits, right? We can't make a blanket statement and say, yes, everyone should be doing X, Y, and Z, and then you'll be just fine, and you've got the health message, you've got diet reform in the bag. No one should think himself a criterion for all. Not all can eat the same things. Exactly. Foods that are palatable and wholesome to one person may be distasteful and even harmful hmm. to another, right? Some can't use milk. Others thrive on it. Some can't digest peas and beans. Others find them wholesome. Nice. For some, the coarser grain preparations are good food, while others cannot use them. Mm. We have to listen. What is your body telling you? And we have to avoid extremes in diet. I just had to laugh as I read this passage from a letter written to Brethren Rice and Gibbs. And I believe this was an institution in Switzerland regarding a brother, Lockwood, who was taking extremes in health reform, particularly in the area of diet reform at the retreat. You need not go into the water or into the fire, but take the middle path, avoiding all extremes. Do not let it appear that you are one-sided, ill-balanced managers. Do not have a meager, poor diet. Do not let anyone influence you to have a diet poverty-stricken. Have your food prepared in a healthful, tasteful manner. We can have healthy food that we enjoy. It's not a sin to enjoy our food. I believe God made us to enjoy, right? Mm. But our number one has to be honoring Him. And um, with the great backsliding upon health reform is because unwise minds have handled it and carried it to such extremes that it has disgusted in place of converting people to it. We definitely don't want to disgust people instead of converting them to it, right? I have been where these radical ideas have been carried out. Vegetables prepared with only water and everything else in like manner. This kind of cookery is health deform. Wow, that is not health reform, it's health deform. So I think we have to be cautious with extremes, right? There's a lot of warning about not going to one extreme or the other. There's another passage. Those who understand the laws of health and who are governed by principle will shun the extremes, both of indulgence and of restriction. Right? And when we do this, our example will be a testimony in favor of right principles. And we can have a wide influence for good. So what are these two extremes all about? There's the extreme nutritional <coughs> restriction. And then on the other end, there's the extreme nutritional indulgence. And the extreme nutritional restriction is basically this ideology. Food has moral value, and I cannot eat anything without feeling guilt or shame. Mm -hmm. Is this healthy, yes or no? No. No, right? A person with this ideology might feel guilt even about eating the things that are, that are healthy and exactly. nourishing to the body. And this is something that is coined diet culture within the dietetics realm, right? Diet culture is a big term being talked about these days. And here is a quote from an article 
uh, from a licensed social worker talking about kind of the danger of diet culture. This is what she says. Companies make billions of dollars off of convincing society that food and bodies are inherently moral or immoral. So basically, diet culture is blamed well, actually, back, backtrack. Morality, right, placing morality on food is blamed for the diet culture. So when we consider these moral beliefs, Western ideals of self-control, self-denial of physical desires, and even fasting to show dependence on a higher power, we see how food gets assigned moral value. You can also see how someone with an eating disorder might try to achieve those ideals through disordered eating. For some people, obtaining personal identity, meaning in life, and a sense of moral worth is attempted through the control of one's body and eating behaviors. I just have to find it interesting that Western ideals are getting blamed here when self-denial and fasting to show dependence on higher power is actually extremely prevalent in Eastern ideals. Exactly. But of course, Western ideals is kind of just a statement to mean Christianity these days. So really what's being said here is if you have Western ideals or if you're a Christian, you're more likely to have an eating disorder, according to this social worker. Wow. Now, this is something I have personally seen and worked with in my field in dietetics. One of my rotations throughout my dietetic internship was at a residential eating disorder facility. And I had a patient who was admitted because he refused to eat anything. Hmm. He was a young male in his early 20s. He had just become a Christian about a year previous. In all of our conversations, he cited his firm religious convictions as the reason for his extreme fasting. And we're not talking about a seven-day juice fast. We're talking about starvation and real physical and mental consequences of this course of action. But the patient felt that starving himself brought him closer to God mm. and allowed him to have more discipline. To him, it was something that justified him as worthy in the sight of God. But food is not the enemy. We can see that very clearly throughout Scripture. And these are just some examples, right? God put Adam and Eve in a garden and gave them good food to eat. God rained down bread from heaven to feed his people when they were in the wilderness. Jesus fed the multitudes with bread and fish. Jesus ate the Last Supper with his disciples. Jesus made breakfast for the disciples. Jesus is described as he came eating and drinking. He was even accused of being a glutton. Jesus plans to drink the fruit of the vine with us in heaven. The tree of life will bear 12 kinds of fruit in heaven, yet there will be no hunger or thirst in heaven. And yet God prepares a feast for us there. Food will be for healing, for pleasure, for enjoyment. <coughs> We can see that food is not a bad thing throughout all of Scripture, and it's not a bad thing in heaven either. Food is not the enemy, right? Of course, there is value in fasting, there is value in self-denial, but we have to be cautious about extremes and understand that food is not the enemy. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Though I believe this patient was completely sincere, he was experiencing a counterfeit form of self-denial. Christ never asks anything of us that would be for our harm or detriment. Right? It's the enemy that seeks to do harm and to kill. Christ desires to give us more abundant life in him starting now and through eternity. And I think we can see the danger of fasting to appease God, right? A legal religion can never lead souls to Christ, for it is a loveless, Christless religion. Fasting or prayer that is actuated by self-denying spirit is an abomination in the sight of God. Self-justifying. Yes, it's self-justifying. And our, we know our own works can never purchase salvation. Nothing that we do can change how God thinks about us. He loves us already. And our obedience to him is a response to that love that he has already shown to us, right? But the enemy loves to paint Christianity this way, doesn't he? And it all goes back to the great controversy. 
The enemy desires to use anything that he can to paint God as the severe taskmaster whose laws pose an unnecessary restraint, right? But God is our creator. He is our friend. He made our bodies. He knows what they need to function and to thrive. And his laws of health are for our greatest benefit and for his greatest glory. Our only safety, our only true source of joy, the ultimate pleasure and satisfaction is found only when we are walking in God's will. Food is not immoral. Mm. Our dietary habits do have moral implications. The world wants you to think that accepting that reality strips away your freedom and is going to lead to disordered eating. But the world has a flawed idea of what freedom is. Freedom isn't doing whatever you want. It's doing what you were made by God to do. Right? God is the one who wants to give us freedom. He doesn't want to take away our freedom. And freedom and healing are really one and the same. Now, it's not just physical healing. It's complete healing. Spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. God desires to heal us to set us free, and we will decide. We can choose whether we will be set free from the bondage of sin to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. And that just means yielding ourselves to him, putting our will on his side. So God's desire for us is freedom. His desire for us is healing in our relationship with him and in our relationship with food. And interestingly, your relationship with God and your relationship with food are intimately connected, even according to secular research. Right? This article, a Systematic Review, published in 2015, was examining the relationship between your relationship with God and your relationship with food. And they found that strong and internalized religious beliefs coupled with having a secure and satisfying relationship with God was associated with lower levels of disordered eating, psychopathology, and body image concern. So it's not Western ideals, it's not Christianity that is leading to disordered eating. It's how we are viewing God. It's our relationship with God. If we are having a disordered relationship with God, we're going to have a disordered relationship with food as well. And you can see a superficial faith coupled with a doubtful and anxious relationship with God was associated with greater levels of disordered eating, mm. pathopsychology, and body image concern. As I shared, I believe this patient was very sincere in his beliefs. I would see him sitting outside reading his Bible every day. Mm. I ended up sharing a copy of Ministry of Healing with him, which he accepted gratefully. And he shared with me just before I left my position there, Ashley, I have been reading this incredible book. Mm. I have been highlighting it and underlining it. He was showing me all of his underlines in the book. And I've just been soaking it in. Thank you for sharing this book with me. And I'm like, wow, praise the Lord. Because, you know, you share a book with somebody and you're not even sure, you know, hopefully they're going to read it, right? But he's not just reading it, he's underlining it, he's highlighting it, he's soaking it in. And the funny thing is, I actually got a little bit of a slap on the wrist for sharing this book with him. Um, because I didn't realize at the time there's a policy in the facility that you have to clear any book recommendations with any patients with their therapist before sharing with them. I did not know at the time. Um... But I was reading through the patient notes before I left, and I saw that he told his healthcare team, Ashley shared this amazing book with me, and after I started reading it, I'm not hearing those intrusive thoughts anymore during wow. meal times. Wow. This book is really helping me. Praise the Lord. That's all I can say. And you know, it was incredible because the day after that, the very next day, another patient came up to me and said, I heard about the book you shared 
can I have a copy too? <laughs> and I'm like, I would love to share a copy with you, right? But of course I had to say, well, you know, I have to clear it with your therapist first. But it's possible that there is a copy laying around here somewhere. <laughs> and so I actually, on my last day there, left two copies on a table where I knew she could find it. And I hope that she did. That's great. Mm -hmm. The other extreme is extreme nutritional indulgence. Right? And this ideology is food has no moral value and I can eat whatever I want without feeling any guilt or shame. And this is not surprising in a world where anything goes and truth to most people is subjective. There's your truth, there's my truth, there's his truth, there's their truth, right? This is not a new philosophy, right? This is Very since the dawn of yeah. time, right? It's wise King Solomon, right? There is no new thing under the sun. And it just takes me back to the book of Judges, when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's right. And this is pretty much where we are today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We think that we get to decide, you know, what is truth. And there is multiple truths, right? What is the origin of this problem? Right? I just shared with you that this is nothing new. And really, this started in Eden when the first sin was introduced into the world. Yeah. We see that Eve was intemperate. There's temperance again. Mm -hmm. In her desires, when she put forth her hand to take of the fruit forbidden tree, mm -hmm. self-gratification has reigned almost supreme in the hearts of many women since the fall. Especially has the appetite been indulged and they have been controlled by it instead of reason. Mm -hmm. For the sake of gratifying the taste, Eve transgressed the command of God. And that's really what we've all done since then. All of their fallen sons and daughters have followed the desires of their eyes and of their taste. Mm -hmm. And followed the course of disobedience, just like Eve, flattering themselves that the consequence would not be as fearful as had been apprehended. We can also see that the enemy is using the same tactics throughout all time, right? Even on Christ. When Christ was in the wilderness and the enemy came to tempt him, the first great temptation was upon appetite. Hmm. And why was that the first? It's that's because where it that's where it all started. That's how he knows that that would be the most serious avenue to pursue, to try to break Christ and cause him to sin. Praise the Lord, Christ was victorious. Amen. And we too can be victorious because of his victory. But you can see how the enemy works, right? This is very clearly a moral issue. Satan's leading attack on mankind is through our appetite. That's his first line to us. We can see the importance of diet reform. Missionary work does not consist merely of preaching. It includes personal labor for those who have abused their health and place themselves where they have not moral power to control their appetites and passions. These souls are to be labored for as those, for as those more favorably situated. Our world is full of suffering ones. Mm. We don't even realize just how much we're suffering. How I learned the health message, mm. as I shared, <laughs> hopefully these photos will make sense as I go along. I am a convert. I was not raised an Adventist, but I was raised by a mother who was introduced to Adventism early in her life, mm. but didn't fully embrace the message. And my dad, is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a Mormon, right? So my parents couldn't quite come to an agreement. We weren't raised going to church, my three older brothers and I, growing up. But one part of Adventism that stuck with my mom is the health message, or at least parts of it, right? 
And what she understood of diet reform at the time, she tried to apply in the best of her abilities for us kids growing up. So I was raised vegetarian from birth. I didn't really understand why. I didn't really know anything different. Um, I didn't grow up eating meat. We stayed away from caffeine, right, and alcohol. I just did this because it's what mom taught me to do, right? And it wasn't associated with any convictions on my part. So by the time I was a teenager, I rebelled just a little bit. I never could quite get myself to eat meat, on purpose at least. I think the idea of eating the flesh of a once living being grossed me out, and it still does. But um, I was a typical teenager without any real concern for how what I was eating could be affecting me. Even though I was raised a vegetarian, I wasn't converted. I didn't know the gospel. And I think that is what makes all the difference. Being a healthy vegetarian or vegan on its own is great and everything. I mean, I truly believe that a person can benefit from that in their health. And actually, it can open a way for God to reach that person because their mind is clear and they can discern spiritual things things of eternal weight better. Um, an example of this is when I was an undergrad. I was going through my health coaching certificate program, and part of that was practical hours coaching and being coached by the same person all semester. So, great witnessing opportunity. And uh, the person that I was partnered with, I shared with him openly about my health habits, and especially my plant-based eating pattern, and how satisfied I was with that, and how much it's been a positive in my life, and he was totally intrigued and adopted the plant-based diet, like, right away. Wow. And actually, even five years later, to this day, he still uh, eats plant-based. Um, and the more we got to know each other, the more he wanted to know about why I adopted this way of eating. Why am I so committed to this lifestyle? Which opened the door for more spiritual conversations. And I shared with him, oh, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. You know, this is what we believe. We believe in honoring our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit, etc. And I think... The fact that he changed his eating, it helped to clear his mind and open him up to spirituality. It opened him up to God speaking to him more. And he started going to an Adventist church after that. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's not exactly a happy ending. Right? He ended up dating a Seventh-day Adventist girl who broke his heart. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of jaded him. He ended up, you know, stopped going to church. But I know God is calling him back home. We still stay in touch. He's coming to our wedding next month. Yay. So, praise the Lord. We still communicate. But there are two problems with veganism or vegetarianism apart from Christ. One is simply being vegetarian or vegan does not guarantee that you're eating healthfully. Right? Just because the chips, the cookies, the cupcakes, the donuts are labeled vegan or vegetarian, right? That doesn't mean that they're gonna be healthy for you. Now, there are a lot of foods out there that the vegan community calls accidentally vegan, right? That means that the food technically doesn't have any animal products in it, but it wasn't necessarily made or marketed for vegans or vegetarians. And Oreos are a perfect example of this. Oreos are an accidentally vegan food. Even some flavors of Doritos, right? Fritos, Betty Crocker frosting, things like that are accidentally vegan. And the second and more significant problem is let's say that you're eating a healthy, balanced, vegan or vegetarian diet, but you don't know Christ. Mm -hmm. Not only are you missing out on the greatest blessing of knowing Jesus as your savior and your friend, you're also not even likely to stick with the eating pattern. Did you realize that 84% of vegans and vegetarians do not even stay vegan or vegetarian mm. when they decide to become? 84%. 84%. That's the majority. Do not stick with it. And um, that's because we can't do it without Christ. We can't do anything without Christ. All of our promises, all of our resolutions are like ropes of sand. We can't control our thoughts. We can't control our impulses. We can't control our affections without Jesus reigning supreme in our lives. Right? We must surrender everything to him. And then he will help us. Let's just be honest. Doing 
the right thing is not always the most convenient thing. In fact, oftentimes it's the inconvenient thing that is the right thing. And people don't like being inconvenienced. Uh, convenience plays a huge role in people's decision making and habit formation, right? Inconvenience can affect our motivation. If something is highly inconvenient, it can actually demotivate people and make them less inclined to continue. So that is kind of human nature. The ability to continue with a habit that is inconvenient, that is only Christ. Mm. Being healthy and committed as a vegan or vegetarian is inconvenient. And you know, don't get me wrong, there are way more vegan and vegetarian options these days than there once was back in the day. Uh, and I think it's getting a lot easier. But I think that actually gives even more credence to what I'm saying. Uh, because if it's getting easier and still 84% of vegans and vegetarians are not able to stick with it, that shows that something is missing here. And that something is someone. That's right. And his name is Jesus. Mm. I was raised vegetarian and I still did not have the health message. I wasn't truly and fully introduced to the health message until I was introduced to Jesus. Jesus needs to be at the center of diet reform. The will is the governing power of the nature of man. If the will is set right, all the rest of the being will come under its sway. That's our choice, right? We have to be willing to be made willing to do God's will. And everything else will come into place if we just put our will on God's side. Our promises and our faith are of no account until we put our will on the right side. If you fight the fight of faith with your willpower, there is no doubt that you will conquer. This is the only way to have true diet reform. Your part is to put your will on the side of Christ. When you yield your will to his, he immediately takes possession of you and works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right? Mm. That is Philippians 2, 13. Amen. If your nature is brought under the control of his spirit, everything, your thoughts, your emotions, your impulses, your desires, he can bring them to the place where he desires them to be for us to achieve true healing. He can give us strength that only comes from him, and a life of faith is possible to us. You can never be successful in elevating yourself unless your will is on the side of Christ, cooperating with the Spirit of God. We cannot be better without Jesus in any way. And diet is no exception. Mm. The principles of health reform are found in the Word of God. The gospel of health is to be firmly linked with the ministry of the Word. It is the Lord's design that the restoring influence of health reform shall be a part of the last great effort to proclaim the gospel message. And this is why all of our efforts of improvement are absolutely futile without Christ. So, in my life, how I was introduced to the health message, right? I was supposed to go on a date to a state fair um, in Arizona, where I'm from. But the guy stood me up. So, I still had tickets, and I took my parents. He was clinically insane. <laughs> <laughs> Later, institutionalized. <laughs> This is my fiance, <laughs> Dr. Tim Riesenberger. He's going to be giving some presentations as well. <laughs> and um, while we were leaving, there was a man on the side of the street handing out DVDs from Amazing Discoveries. We took home the DVDs, we mm. popped them in the DVD player, and gong, Amen. my life began to change. Mm -hmm. I watched Walter Weiss' total onslaught, probably all in one night. It was probably like an all-night marathon. <laughs> I could not stop. And 64. Yes, we watched so many of them. She does not. I came right. home from school every day and was watching these. Um, and I remember just being so intrigued by his presentations. 
I had to look up this ministry, so I found their website. And I saw that there was a section on health, and that caught my attention. Because even though I was a teen, and teens are generally able to recover better than the rest of us, my rebellious diet and lifestyle choices were starting to catch up with me, and I was dealing with health challenges. So I wanted to know, how can I get myself out of the mess that I found myself in? I was a child actress. That's kind of the other part of my testimony. Local theater productions. And um, not movies. But I was burning myself out. Late nights, rich foods, right? Indulgent <coughs> foods, and stressful relationships, not getting enough sleep, so on. I was actually in sh three shows at one time on stage with kidney stones. <laughs> oh. And um, so I felt my need for sure. I watched a series on the laws of health from Rudy and Jeannie Davis. Mm. And it was presented in such a way that just drew me. It was my first time being introduced to this concept in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I was learning at this time, for the first time in my life, the value that Christ had put on me. The great love that God has for me. My need of a Savior. How Jesus laid down his life for me to pardon my sin. And I was hearing the gospel for the first time. And this is what made me open and receptive to the health message. Our very first work and our most important thing is to melt and subdue the soul by presenting our Lord Jesus Christ as the sin bearer, the sin pardoning savior, making the gospel as clear as possible. Instead of disparaging Jacob's well, Christ presented something infinitely better. He offered the woman something better than anything she possessed, even living water, the joy and hope of the gospel of his kingdom. And we must never forget, as we are presenting food, you know, food in this life, food on earth, that there is something infinitely better. It is the living water and the bread of life. We must present these together. We were made for more. Human beings were not created to be satisfied in the fleeting joys and pleasures of the world. We were created to be satisfied in the imperishable glory of heaven. We don't want to just make healthy sinners. And even if we could do that, 84% of them would go back anyway. Mm. Right? To have any true lasting positive change in this life and for eternity, we need Jesus. And we don't have to do it alone when we're struggling. Those who are struggling against the power of appetite, look to the Savior in the wilderness of temptation. See him in his agony upon the cross. As he exclaimed, I thirst. He has endured all that is possible for us to bear. There is nothing that we go through that he hasn't gone through. His victory is ours. That is a promise. We can have victory in struggling against the power of appetite in all of its different forms. How can we reach people? Number one, we must present Jesus and allow him to change lives. That has to come first. We cannot separate the gospel and the health message. They are one and the same. Two, we must present the diet reform in the most attractive way possible, right? Hold up the principles of health reform. Let the Lord lead the honest in heart. Present the principles of temperance in their most attractive form. Right? We don't want it to seem like drudgery to follow God's ways, right? God's ways are life and joy and Amen. health to us. And our personal witness will testify of that. Three is don't be people's conscience for them. Right? The last passage said, 
Let the Lord lead the honest in heart. Make the appeal, right? Present the principles. But let the Lord lead those who are hearing. We can't be the Holy Spirit, right? We can't be people's conscience for them. Meet people where they are, right? Be balanced. Shun extremes. I have a friend who is a very staunch ethical vegan, right? She's all about animal rights. All right. We are doing Bible studies together, right? I presented to her Spirit of Prophecy Bible study because she was interested. She actually watched him's presentation on God, my father's, right? He's presenting nice. how the gospel and particularly the Spirit of Prophecy is validated by the oldest living ancient language throughout all of history. That's right. And she's like, who is this prophet that you're talking about? I want to know more. And I'm like, okay, well, this isn't your typical first Bible study, but here we go. And after that Bible study, she's like, I want a copy of Ministry of Health, Ministry what? of Healing. I want a copy of Steps to Christ. I want to read this for myself. And I'm what? like, okay. So, you know, I was able to connect with her just on veganism, right? Oh, yeah, we're on the same team. You know, we eat plant-based food. That's cool. You know, we can connect over that. Meet people where they are. But that's not going to be my approach with my best friend. I think that's what Paul meant when he says, what is I become Be all, all things, things to all people. So, exactly. Like, wherever they're at, that's where you meet them. Absolutely. Meeting people where they are, that's exactly <laughs> the passage I think of in Scripture when Paul is talking about being all things to all people. Great point. So be balanced. Shun the extremes. Right? I wouldn't take the same approach with my best friend who is from a completely different end of the spectrum. She's like, yeah, meat, you know, all these different things that she is over here about. We are going to find common ground on something else, right? And so we can meet people where they are and be just a light and influenced by our kindness and our love to them and just exemplifying in our own lives what the health reform can do. Four would be become very familiar with the Bible and spirit of prophecy. I would say comb through it. Mm. Comb through it and just take it in and ask the Lord to show you how you can apply this to your own life. There's so much more than just the eight health laws in there, right? There is so much more that can be applied to your life to help you to have healing in ways that you never even thought possible. And I think that the more that we become familiar with this, the more that we know it, the more that we apply it to our lives, the more that we are the living example, right? First Timothy 4, 12, be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, in everything in your life, right? Be an example of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, of what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, of what it means to adopt God's amazing, beautiful health principles that are life-giving. Our words, our acts, our dress, our deportment, even the expression of our countenance has an influence. Do you think our eating habits, do you think our lifestyle habits have an influence as well? Upon the impression thus made there hang the results for good or evil which no man can measure. The silent witness of a true, unselfish, godly life carries an almost irresistible influence. Mm. When those who profess to serve God follow Christ's example, practicing the principles of the law, even the natural law, in their daily life. When every act bears witness that they love God supremely, and their neighbor as themselves, then will the church have the power to move the world. Then will the church have the power to move the world. When we practice this, when we actually incorporate this in our own lives, when we are the example. Don't just tell something. Don't just tell people about something better. Show them something better. The best, most irrefutable evidence of how amazingly incredible God's health plan is, is you applying it to your own life. Exactly. It's your own testimony. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. No one can argue with your own life because you're, you're you. You're, you're standing right there. You are a testimony. Walking, living, breathing testimony that God is good and his ways are life and peace. And that is the conclusion of the presentation. We'll close Amen. with prayer and then we'll open it up for some questions. Mm.
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that all of your ways are life-giving. Lord, we desire to honor you with our whole lives, even with the things that we eat, with the things that we do, Lord, even with our thoughts and our attitudes. Lord, help us to, when we leave from this place, and even now, to be a witness and a light for you. Help us to be balanced in all of our reforms, Lord. And help us, most importantly, to put our will on the side of Christ and to submit ourselves completely, wholly, unreservedly to you, Lord, that we may be a powerful witness, an irresistible influence for the gospel, Lord, for the salvation of many souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> All right. Questions? That guy who had the unhealthy view of fasting, I assume he was just maybe a non-denominational Christian. I know he wasn't Seventh-day Adventist, but he wasn't. was there a particular branch of Christianity that caused him to feel that fasting was very necessary? I don't remember yeah, exactly I, what he was. I think I remember him sharing that he was going to like a non-denominational non assembly, yeah, but okay. they tended to focus a bit more on the fasting mm -hmm. in okay. that group of believers. That's a great question. You, you said something about the uh, Oreos. I remember years ago, reading an article, the uh, lady that was in charge of health and temperance in the church I was, my, well, my first Adventist church I was in, uh, she used to would always put uh, health nuggets in the bulletin. and. There was an article in there about the, the Oreos, uh, uh, and what, what it was, the, the same engineer who had helped cigarette companies uh, make people become more addicted to cigarettes, they had hired to try to make people more addicted to Oreos, to try to strategize a way that, they, that you know, they could raise their sale uh, mm -hmm. margin up. You have to question when that, that sort of tactic is used in food marketing, mm -hmm. right? Yes? So I have a relative who is, um, this, her diet has been terrible her entire life. Uh, she's recently become an Adventist a couple of years ago. Praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm vegan, have been for a long time, and it basically started on a journey when I used to have migraines twice a week. And they would last 36 hours. And so you can imagine wow. two days a week of 36 hours at every family gathering, I had a migraine. And I mean, I would get, you know, you can last them for the first few hours, but as they go, they get worse and worse. So I didn't become an Adventist till I was 21. And unfortunately, nobody decided to introduce me to the health message because I think they either know it or they thought I would, they'd hurt my feelings. Mm. But what I, and I, I have a reason for saying this, but what I found in my journey was that, well, you, if you don't have caffeine, that's a trigger for migraines, so it helped a little bit. But I found getting the right sleep was a major importance. I found that getting, I could get up in the morning, and you can feel when you're going to have a migraine, or I could. Mm -hmm. I could get on the treadmill and run for 15 minutes, and I had a probably 30% chance of avoiding that migraine just from doing that. But it, and, and I found out about drinking water, because I stopped drinking soft drinks, so now I'm actually thirsty, so I'm drinking more water. And then as time went on, the final trigger for me was I lost, um, I found out by accident that milk was a trigger for me for migraines. Mm. Stop that, and I haven't had a migraine in over 20 years. Now, the Lord, I haven't amazing. had that That's headache one. in over 20 years. So the health message is absolutely fantastic. And the reason I bring this up, this person I've known since I got married, <clears throat> and they know my, I, I tell my story to everybody, because I'm like, why do you want to suffer? But anyways, she is still has no um, ability to make the decision she needs to make to live a healthier lifestyle. She's doing maybe 2% better <laughs> over a two-year time period. And what I'm wondering is, where are the resources, number one, that I can use? Because I know for me, but when you're sharing with somebody who's not as certain you need more definite resources, I go strictly by spirit of prophecy. But where are the resources on diet that tell you what you need to eat, you know, what foods are going to produce what, that's at a simplified level. Because I have Dr. Bice's book and whatnot, and I can go and I use it as a resource. But how, you know, I, she's low on iron right now. 
And, you know, I'm, and she's saying, well, the doctor says I should eat meat. And I said, no, you don't need meat. You need to eat this, 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 and this. But, but what are the resources that she can go to, that she can find this stuff out? Because she has no dedication, and she doesn't, she, she's very easily confused. So how do you get past that? Because she's already an advocate. She's already read Steps to Christ. She's mm. already done some of these things, and it's not clicking. Mm. And, and she's suffering for it. Yes. Well, I think the first thing is she has to be willing. Right? She has to be willing and open to receive whatever uh, message that you would like to share with her. Uh, and I say if she's not open and willing, then pray and love her. Uh, do that anyway. Um, but if she is open and willing to read something, to watch something, the best thing to share with her would be the thing that she would actually watch, the thing that she would actually listen to. Thing that she would actually read. And there's a lot out there. A lot of organizations today are doing a really a better job than we are in some ways at promoting the diet reform, right? There's an organization called the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM. You can find resources online. You can actually even connect with their physicians um, for telehealth appointments. We actually even offer health coaching services yeah. right now, and it's all donation-based. Actually, we have taken in two Ukrainian refugee families into Tim's home, and we've committed to help supporting them for the next couple of years, and so we are just accepting donations through our local church. Any amount. Of any, any amount, amount for a health coaching in, session. And she'll talk to your friend for an hour. Yeah. Like one on You can one. get an hour with me or 15 minutes with Or 15 minutes with Tim. Minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And, or you can donate again and get another, you know, exactly. see. It's it's so can I reach out to you by that email address? I'm that's on you that. can. You can also find us at onlylongevity.org. Yeah. Onlylongevity.org. Yeah. And we would be happy to yeah. longevity.org. Yeah. Yes. I'm interested in your educational background. You say you went to Arizona. What, what was the steps you took? And this was to become a nutritionist, right? Yes. I mean, Thank you for I, asking. Why don't you tell me? I have a follow-up question. Okay. All right. So I went to Arizona State University. I actually started off at Glendale Community College. Full ride scholarship. I just want to throw <laughs> that in there. Yes. Full ride, 100%. And the reason that that was my path is because I started off at, at Glendale Community College, and they said, hey, you exceeded all of your exams. We'll let you come here for free for three years. Okay. So I did three years at Community College. While I was there, I joined an honors society, Phi Theta Kappa, where I applied for two national scholarships. And I was one of 10 students selected nationally to get a scholarship to cover the rest of my education at Arizona State University, where I studied health sciences, I studied um, health and wellness coaching, and then I got my degree also in nutrition and dietetics. So the path that I took was to become a registered dietitian. So that path, is changing just slightly, but what it used to look like is after you graduate from your nutrition program, you have to go through a supervised practice program of a thousand or more hours within different realms of dietetics, food service, clinical, community, etc. After you complete these hours, you get a statement that proves, hey, so-and-so completed these hours, they're eligible to sit for the dietetic exam, and that's why I am registration eligible because I have not finished the hours and I can sit for the exam. After I pass the exam, I can actually say, hey, I'm a registered dietitian now, and I can apply for licenses in whichever states. Actually, Michigan does not do licensure for dietitians, and neither does Arizona. So these are the two states where you can practice without a license. So anyone can do that. So anyone so can this, do medical So she's care. like, if you've heard of a board-certified physician, mm -hmm. she's board-eligible. Right. So she's finished all her stuff. She just has to sit for the board mm -hmm. at yep. this point. So during my internship, I was doing it with a program that's a distance program, which means that I was responsible for finding all of my rotation sites. So I called places. I arranged the rotations. So one of them that I shared with you already is the eating disorder hospital that I was in. I also spent some time at a small um, outpatient wellness clinic doing diabetes prevention and management. I also did some employee wellness. But that, that took company. almost three years. I want to share that because none of the internship sites to which she also got a scholarship 
one of only two individuals who got it. None of them would honor the Sabbath mm -hmm. or the jab mm -hmm. exemption. Mm -hmm. So it took two, three years. Right. To I, finally I graduated get in spring yeah. of 2021, yeah, right so in the midst of all the COVID while. craziness. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to work for a while if I can do that, you know, and allow God to open the doors that need to be open and close the doors that need to be closed. And praise the Lord, last year when I applied for the internship program, I was selected to be in my top program. And as Tim shared, I had a scholarship to help cover part of that as well. So God is very good. What was your follow-up question? The follow-up was this. Is I personally am petrified of any education in any category of the world. Mm -hmm. Arizona State is that. Yes. So my question is, is why not go an Adventist route and is there is there an Adventist route? Sure. Absolutely. That's a great question. And I can completely understand uh, concern for world education. I think my desire, well, first of all, I was very prayerful about this whole thing from start to finish. And that's a whole testimony in and of itself, how God has just opened doors time and time again um, through some of the most challenging situations. My dad actually was diagnosed with cancer at the beginning of this year when I was supposed to start my internship program. And I thought I wouldn't be able to finish because they're changing the requirements next year where you have to have a master's degree in order to even get into the internship. And I am not master's level just yet. Um, so I was thinking, well, I'm going to have to defer. And if I defer, I may not even become a dietitian. But why did I decide to actually become a dietitian rather than just going and getting, you know, going to Weimar or uh, Heartland or wherever it might be? Yeah, I'm not sure. My question is, is, is if there is an Adventist route, why did you choose Arizona State rather than the Adventist route? Well, I don't think it has to be either or. I think, I think what, his, what his question, and we've kind of discussed this too, mm -hmm. is when you look at sort of the recommendation, most of our students should go to get a Christian Adventist-based education. There's absolutely true. There's a, two statements, though, that talk about a few students, very, very few, who should be like the Waldensians, who would be like Daniel, Joseph, and go to the worldly schools, right, in order to be a light, a witness, things like that. Now, that's a very precarious sort of thing. And she says, it, very it, few. She says, very it few. Sounds like Joseph and Daniel were forced to go to the worldly. The schools. Waldensians were not, though. That's what I'm saying. The Waldensians intentionally went to Oxford. Intentionally went to those schools in Europe to purposefully be there as students, and. To share the gospel, and then and they couldn't figure out where where did this all come from? Where why are people like thinking along these ideas in the Bible? But it came from them, right? Mm -hmm. And they actually would intentionally put on like they would be merchants or something like that, and they would sell silks or jewelry and yeah. etc. So so there's a few statements, but only like two that I'm aware <laughs> of. It's very bossy where she says some students should be encouraged to go to those schools, mm -hmm. but the vast majority, as you point out. Absolutely true. One of the other things that I've found, having been kind of the whole spectrum, I went to UC Davis on a full scholarship, but then I went uh, to Loma Linda, I went to Weimar, right? I went to Montemorelos, so one of our other schools, and then I went to Stanford. So I've had, kind of had the whole perspective. What I'll share from my standpoint, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying all Adventist schools are like this, but sometimes it's easier to go to a worldly school because your guard's up. Versus if you go to an Adventist school that you're expecting, you're where everyone's going to be standing oh, strong and firm, mm -hmm. then they take you off guard. Yes. And they're actually not that way at all. Well, so, it sounds like you're saying I should go to a bar because my... No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's a thought. And I'm saying there are two statements in the Spirit of Prophecy that encourage some students to go to the world. What about this idea? We have almost no infrastructure at all within Adventism to do any of this stuff, none whatsoever. So to go through our systems and build our systems up and encourage our systems because we almost have to go to the world to get this. Mm -hmm. And then we have to make sure that we can dilute out the cyanide that's been put in. But we have no system within Adventism isn't to really do this. Well, there's a, there's well, a master's at yeah. Andrews now. We just looked at this one recently. Actually, a lot of the Adventist schools do have a dietetics program. Yeah. And I will be honest, when I was getting accepted to college, I was a brand new Adventist. 
So I didn't, didn't know really all know stuff. all this stuff. I mean, I was learning as time went on. There's a lot of things I didn't learn just in the last few years. Um, so I didn't really see it as an option to pursue Adventist education. But there are dietetics programs at La Melinda, at Andrews. I believe even Southern has a dietetics mm -hmm. program. Um, and you can become a registered dietitian through that. And I will say becoming a registered dietitian does have its advantages because not every state is Michigan or Arizona. Mm -hmm. So you can't practice just anywhere, medical nutrition therapy, um, without a license, nor would I necessarily recommend that you do that. It would be like advocating for a physician to practice without a license. You want somebody to be educated, not necessarily in the ways of the world, but I think that you can have that license and it allows you the opportunity to do more and to be more of a witness because dietetics actually you are talking with patients for a longer period of time, you're talking with them for an hour in most cases, and you really get to know them over a long period of time because they're seeing you over and over again. That's not always the case with a physician, right? They, how long would you say that you spend less with a patient in the ER? So there's opportunities to witness there, don't get me wrong, but it's just a different dynamic. I appreciate you asking those questions. I'm not completely so here. Do you have, oh, that's okay. uh, that's you have a child okay. that's thinking of going to school? Is that what you're asking? I have a child that I wouldn't let him go to school because, oh, okay. because the world will destroy like this, him. and I believe our colleges destroy you as well. So I, mm. I wouldn't let him go. So he's trying to say, well, where do you go? You know, yeah. and, I, and I think yeah, that I some of, some of the options, like she was looking at an online master's, so that way the child's still at home. And, but they're doing the program online, which you could also look at too. Like you're in the school, you're in the classroom with your kid. You can say, hey, let's see what you're learning. Look yeah. through a lecture or whatever and like, oh, I like that. Or, oh, what's that? You know what I mean? So I think that those seems, sort of things might be... It seems this mentality is also within the spiritual realm where a lot of our spiritual leaders actually have to go outside of Adventism to schools and the theological courses outside. And there's always a danger that comes with that. Absolutely. And, and so, we seem to have a lot that go through that, Absolutely. which I think is a problem. Yeah, I would say with any decision in life, prayerfully consider the way forward mm -hmm. and allow God to lead wherever that might be for your son, you said? He's, yeah. he's way My past son's 40 now. He's, he's okay. established. But. Hey, I mean, God knows what his plan for our lives is. He knows what his plan A through plan Z and I believe that he has a perfect way forward for each one of us and will lead us exactly where we need to be, you know, with the circumstances that we have. I always say this, do the best you can where you are with what you have. Just allow God to take care of the rest. Exactly. Yes? Yeah, and he, God provided you a way to uh, get your education with the scholarships and everything too. And you wouldn't have that opportunity with other schools. And so that was given to her. Well, she applied to Adventist for Sorry. Adventist institutions for her internship, and they wouldn't accept her. Right, Loma Linda, I tried. Her. Her. It's, it's not because of any sort of education. Yeah, her academia is powerful, but she, she, they only take their own from the feeder schools. Mm -hmm. So that's what they said. So she tried. She tried to go with Loma Linda, and I think Andrews, I think several. Yeah, I tried yeah. several. Yeah, they wouldn't accept her. They would well, honor the Sabbath. The question, too, is yeah. back to her original question. Um, and she said her friend needs iron. What plant-based nutritional system do you have for that? I'm glad you I know you want to answer <laughs> When he said, well, you just have to eat meat. And that's all. That's what it's going to be. But I'd be cautious with that because if someone says, well, you have low iron, there's many causes of low iron. And you have to remember that in the case of illness, as Ministry of Healing, page 127 says. The cause should be ascertained. The first step is the cause should be ascertained. Most people I encounter, like I'll be at camp meeting and someone's sucking on some aloe vera. I said, well, why are you taking aloe vera? Well, I have an ulcer. I said, how do you know you have an ulcer? Well, every time I eat, I get pain right here. I said, I can think of 24 things that can do that. And maybe one of them is gastric ulcer. And the, the thing is, is that I think we need to discover the cause. Like, why is the iron low? What's the TIBC? Is it an absorption? Is it a utilization? Is it a binding issue? There's many sort of causes of low iron. And for someone to say, well, you just need to eat meat, is a very simplistic way of, right. I think, approaching it. But if truly there's no hemoglobinopathy, there's no thalassemia, there's no binding capacity issue, there's no absorption, sort of whatever issue, then if it's truly just that, I think that she could talk to her and coach her. Because she had a very similar problem 
and like is basically normal. My grandmother had a, to the point where hers was so low she was getting transfusions every three months. And after just five minutes, five, not, excuse me, five months on a program that I kind of sifted out from the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, my grandmother's levels were all normal. Everything normalized with zero iron infusions, with zero transfusions. Micah, she is under a doctor's care, and the doctor, after listening to her and doing whatever test he would have done, he says, you need to take iron supplements and you need deep red meat. Now, my concern is, and I've, I've been through the doctor, full, full disclosure, I had cancer in 2021. And I did go through chemotherapy, and I did go through radiation after talking to five pastors, two Adventist doctors, and Ethan Valley. Um, but what I found was, I, when I went into the doctor for, for the surgery, my hemoglobin was 3.4. So they didn't wow. even transfusion. So when I'm I came, they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really bad. So they did a surgery, they did a full hysterectomy, and by this time my hemoglobin is about 6 or 7. So I asked my surgeon, well, what should I do? And he says, well, eat a lot of red meat. And so, well, that wasn't in the, the you know, what I was going to do. Which is a carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization. Exactly. So, so in about a month and a half, before I actually went into treatment, I raised my uh, hemoglobin up to like 11.2 on a strictly, very strict vegan diet. Now, wow. it was not impoverished, mm -hmm. but it was a good diet. And so I'm telling her, look, this doesn't make any sense. Just because a doctor says it doesn't mean you should do it. Mm -hmm. You've got to use a filter of going through the spirit of prophecy and understanding what the thing is and use the doctor as a tool, Amen. not as God. And, and so that's what I'm trying to, so when I, you know, I told her you, you don't need the red meat. I've been there, done this. If all your problem is is you've got low iron and there's not an underlying cause, this is what you need to do. And so, but I'm, again, I'm wondering is there like a website where you can go to find out what foods are good for what things, um, that type thing. Yeah, we'll, we'll coach her. There's also nutritionfacts.org. I was thinking of nutritionfacts.org. Uh, but nutritionfacts.org is owned um, by Michael Gregor. Right. And Gregor is very intelligent, very savvy. He's one of the PCRM docs. But keep in mind, he's, he's not SDA, and he's a strong proponent of caffeine. Yeah. So not, not everything is right. going right. to be the same. So, so any, like any, said, other, any other questions? Like people who have specific questions. I can add in something about iron too. Sure. I think that we hear a lot in the world that you know heme iron, which is from animal sources. You know that is the best source of iron because it's most readily digestible by your body, highly absorbable. That's not a good thing. <laughs> you don't want to absorb too much iron. There, it's amazing how God has created plants in such a way to actually keep us from absorbing too much. <laughs> But a lot of the secular dietetics world is like, oh, that means that plant iron is bad. But it's actually the opposite. It's actually a protective mechanism for us because higher levels of heme iron actually is associated with things like more type 2 diabetes, higher incidence of cancer, things like that. Yeah. And heart disease, exactly. And it's actually even the case with iron supplements too. So we have to be very cautious. I would say if somebody, if somebody is going to supplement, do it with a whole food plant-based Mm -hmm. supplement or something that I can share is it's called nature's blood transfusion and it's equal parts of three things black shot molasses black cherry concentrate and liquid chlorophyll yes and that's nice. a natural remedy that can help you to raise iron levels in conjunction with medical care what were those three things again? Uh, the three chlorophyll, things black shot molasses, and dark cherry concentrate. Yeah, dark black cherry. cherry concentrate, liquid chlorophyll, and black shot molasses. And you can buy those things? Sure. I, mean, I know you can buy them. Yeah, yeah. health food store, sure. you can find them online. Yeah. You mix it all together, right? Blend Equal it really parts, well. one, one, and one. So Every three. tablespoon would have about close to four milligrams of iron, which is not insignificant. So okay. one tablespoon would be a serving in a need like that? No, it really depends on your age and your uh, sex as well, right? If you're a woman of childbearing age, you're, you definitely, your needs are higher. If you're menstruating, your needs are higher. If there's any sort of bleeding condition, your needs are going to be higher. Um, but it just depends. And I would definitely consult with a registered dietitian or health professional to know exactly what that level should be. So just curious, postmenopausal, no bleeding, um, terrible diet. <laughs> 
would one or two tablespoons be reasonable? I'm not asking you to prescribe, but sure. Just have the person. I think talk. Yeah. I think what's best instead of yes, uh, a third party sort of like this friend of mine who has this. What should I recommend to them? Just have them talk to her. Okay. I think that yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's hard to diagnose when someone's just telling you a story about themselves. It's almost impossible when they're telling you about their relative or friend that's, right? Because you can't do a history and physical on that person. So I think it's probably more responsible to have to just talk to Ashley. Okay. Sounds good. Yes. So, you know, as I was listening to Dr. Hess, uh, you know, addressing some of the issues, uh, you know, that we have, there's something I haven't noticed. I've been in the church for 30 years. There's not a lot of evidence in our churches that we even care about this health message. I've, I've learned that's just, that's just the honest mm -hmm. truth of it. That's one challenge. So when it comes to like, you know, we should have uh, these uh, sanitariums in our area. Uh, we live in an area where there's several Seventh-day Adventist churches and there's nothing like that that I'm aware of that even though, are anybody interested in even doing some of that nature, you know. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing I thought of is this. You know who Dr. Barbara O'Neill is? Yes. From Australia. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a nurse, nurse, not a physician, just just, just a little caveat. She's oh. great. I love Barbara O'Neill, but just to make I think she calls herself a naturopathic physician as well. But okay. I'm not sure I don't know her, I don't know her actual qualifications. But I was going to say, even if you start something, the NBA has become so powerful in our country that, you know, they, and I'm not saying it to suppress or say, oh no, we shouldn't do that. I'm saying there are some challenges that we have to face because it's like we'd have to have somebody like you that'd be qualified to come in. Otherwise, you know, the, the state comes and says, you don't know what you're doing. You know, you don't know sure. what business happened to anybody, right? right. They banned Barbara. Right. Home, they're right. crazy. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You can right. practice in Australia now. It's yeah. wild. Yeah. In the homeless, you know, when you talk about the health diet, I've seen documentaries where people have been doctors and stuff and end up being homeless. And when they, stay on that that trash can food and that fast food that people will buy them sometimes. I worked with the homeless for Their years. minds, they, they begin, they develop into mental issues where, it's very true. you know. So what was your question? I'm sorry, I just wanted, just for the recording, the, what was your question? Well, I was just basically just addressing, saying. you know, what we're looking at facing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in society is like, you know, when you want to take part and say, well, how, how could I start a ministry? How can I uh, get involved without getting myself in trouble at the same time? Right. You know, like how far do I go? That's a good question, right? Things? How can we actually apply this? How can we start a ministry? And I would say just be enterprising. There's so many different avenues that we can take. I'm thinking of one of my mentors. Um, he So there are diabetes self-management education training programs and diabetes prevention programs all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. that people with diabetes and prediabetes, they're going online to find where are these classes being held. Mm -hmm. And my mentor has this idea of bringing it into the churches. And I think it's genius because people actually will even pay to go to these classes. They're in high demand because... So many people in the United States are being diagnosed with prediabetes and diabetes. A vast, vast, almost majority of people are, are getting prediabetes or diabetes these days. And so they're looking for these classes, they're looking for these programs. And if we can actually bring them into the church and have people coaching and teaching within the church environment, that's already a huge opportunity to witness. And you don't need to be, you know, a registered dietitian to teach diabetes prevention program classes. You can be trained as a diabetes prevention coach um, through a program, and it's not a very lengthy program, right? You just learn how to facilitate classes. It's basically a group discussion, and you're kind of reading off of a script. You know, almost anybody can do that. And we can incorporate the diet reform into this as well. Um, so I think that's a huge opportunity, but there's other places that we can start doing things that are even small. The local library near my house, they have cooking classes from... Who knows who is teaching these? And I'm like, why isn't the church coming and exactly. doing this? There's so many opportunities for us within our own communities to see a need and to fill that need. Right? So I think that we just have to be enterprising. We have to look for opportunities. And most importantly, just as we've talked about, we have to put our will on the side of Christ as a church. There's a lot of people who are not dedicated and they're not seeing the importance of diet reform or health reform in general. And I think that's just showing 
our Laodicean state, right? We are neither cold nor hot. Um, but I believe the Lord will take care of that. I think in terms of legalities, even though I'm licensed, I'm boarded, etc., she could bill insurance, whatever. Mm -hmm. We've chosen to go the coaching route mm -hmm. because I don't know where the person is contacting me from. And the way the licensing laws work is the location of the, of the patient. person. Yeah. Patient who's contacting you, not where you I have to be licensed in their you state. Have to, yes, you have to be licensed in their oh, jurisdiction. Right. It's not so, enough if you're licensed in your own state. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm licensed in eight different states and stuff like that, but not all of them, right? Because right? it, it, you're, you're paying, you're paying like a grand or fifteen. Yeah. You just saw my bill, right? Right. You saw for a twelve hundred dollar bill for one state just to maintain the license, and it's not it's not a difficult thing as long as you're doing your continuing education. And you actually maintain a license and don't get like sued a bunch of times or whatever. I've been sued ever, praise the Lord. But mm -hmm. as long as that's the case, and you give them like twelve hundred dollars <laughs> every two years, then the, then it's fine. But yeah, as no far as legalities, you cannot give either a prescription or medical advice mm -hmm. without a license. Yeah. So what you have to say is this is coaching, and when we send people written forms of our coaching. There's a little caveat, this will not replace the relationship with your physician. Make sure to clear it with them, etc. Mm -hmm. This is not constitute medical advice, this is only suggestions, coaching, and things like that. So I make that a clear in writing sort of caveat before I'll coach anybody. Okay. They have to agree to that. I see. So, yeah. Was there another question? Well, I was going to ask, um, there's going to come a time we all believe when everything is going to collapse. Our church systems are going to collapse, the medical systems, the insurance, even pharmaceuticals are going to collapse. And so we know that we need to understand these health principles to help people out in the world. So we have this person that Debbie's talking about who's low on arm. We're telling her that she can take this concoction you just mentioned to us, uh, but we don't know the dose now. The thing would be is when, when there's no one she can call, who teaches us this type of thing? And this is just a, a, a piece of sand on a beach of all the knowledge we need. We're not going to be able to have somebody call you at that point in time. We need to have this information. Absolutely. Where do we get it? How, who teaches us this? Not just this. We know the concoction here that you just mentioned, but we don't know the dose. We don't know how often to give her. We have to call you to get that now. But you're, where, you're not going to be there later. And it's not just iron here. I, I recall a story from Ellen White where she, and I'll really cut this short, she was asked to go somewhere to help a man, and she didn't want to go. She was busy or something happened. Finally, she did go. When she got there, she said, go get this, 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 make a concoction, put it on his stomach, and it took care of his problem. The next day, he was fine. She had that knowledge. We don't have that knowledge. Where and how do we get it in the, in the great multitude that we're going to need it when, when the time comes where we can't make a phone call to you or anybody else. Right. And I think that at that point, it goes back to evaluating and listening to what our body is saying. Because if we won't be able to go back to the professional or the textbook or Google even, right, we're going to have to try our best, use the remedies, and see what is happening. I well, think I'm just saying our knowledge right now is a big donut. <laughs> we don't we don't have the first clue about anything. I mean, uh, we know somebody who's a little sick, and what was that you mentioned? Just uh, about, about what? He mentioned an herb. It's just out of the clear blue. Let's try that. It's like we we don't have any basis of knowledge well, we at know all. Charcoal. And okay. it seems like the church would have developed that years ago, sure. so that we would really be in the know today. But yeah, I, mean, know there's, I think there's a lot of training programs for natural remedies, right, babe? I'm thinking of. Harlan, don't they have a program where you well, can Well, I think I like his, I like his, I, his, his, uh, like, if someone who's starting at donut level, yeah. I would say maybe give them, like, a ministry of healing to start with. I would say that would be yeah. a good place to I'm start. I'm past that. I've got the ministry of healing. I've okay. read it a couple times. Okay. Because that's a good foundation. I would say that's a good foundation, right. but someone Same who has the, 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 the zero or the donut level, I give them that. <laughs> if someone wants to know kind of practical applications, coming to stuff like this, I'm going to be presenting kind of simple sort of remedies that anyone can implement with, without any education whatsoever. Because uh, I'm going to say how to share the health message with anybody. 
right? Mm -hmm. And that, the thing is, is that you can't share the health message with anybody if you don't know it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be giving practical sort of things. Is, at, this, is it 1.30? Is this is something we'll be able to, to find you online? Or yeah, online? I'm on the same website. Yeah. I'm is on the same website. Only longevity.org. I can actually try to pull yeah. it. I'll yes. put up the QR code and stuff like that during my presentation. Okay. You'll get to see it multiple okay. times. And if, if someone makes a donation, they can sit down with me for 15 minutes, or they can sit down with her within an hour. But okay. we're, I'm going to be sharing kind of an overview of very simple but powerful ways. And the thing that I do for people who are the donut level is the ministry of healing. Beyond donut would be like training in your church. And then advanced, like with Ashley, there's some more subtle nuances of things. Like afterwards, I'll talk to her. Uh -huh. And I will give her more clues on history taking and things like that. Because many times people will tell you the diagnosis. Like when you're talking to them, they'll tell you the diagnosis. So after you guys all go, many of your comments were excellent, excellent examples of history taking. And I will ask her, I'll say, in this such and such a comment, what was the etiology? Because the person told you. The person told you. 90% of their, your diagnosis with a patient is going to come from what the patient says. So what they say to you is very important, but that's a more advanced sort of thing to pick up, like subtle clues, subtle nuances of where this person has this symptom, what's the cause? Well, they told you in their history. And there were two people with diabetes, right? And I, I was at ASI. Did I talk to, about them about anything about food? No. Because that wasn't the cause. And a lot of us don't think that way. The cause isn't always what you're eating. It may be what's eating you. So. All right. All right. So I think we got to close time now for, for lunch. I think. break and then lunch. But thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate your thoughtful questions and comments.